weekly webinar from IMW. Uh, this day's uh, topic is biogas upgrading project technology considerations with the topic ensuring success and viable economics for your renewable natural gas to CNG or pipeline projects. My name is Thomas Melhorn. I'm the Director of Sales and Business Development for North America and Europe. And today's speaker is uh, Ricardo Hamden from Green Lane Biogas. And uh, the technical support today is uh, John Michel Logan, uh, lead engineer from Green Lane, and also uh, David Van Law, application engineer and product solution group lead at IMW Industry. IMW has been established in, in 1912. Uh, since 1984, we are building uh, non-lubricant uh, compression technologies, uh, and we are dedicated to non-lube uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the industry. We are part of Clean Energy, uh, which is our uh, parent company based down in uh, Los Angeles in California. Uh, Clean Energy runs about 450 LNG stations and 120, uh, 450 CNG stations and 120 LNG stations across the United States, and uh, is well known uh, in the United States. Also, Clean Energy also operates Clean Energy Renewable Fuels, where it produces renewable natural gas from several landfill and digestive projects throughout the United States. Branded as Redeem, it is distributed through clean energy stations, allowing RNG for fleet and customer use. For those in the United States who are dialed in today, you may have probably seen the Redeem sticker on uh, municipal buses, waste management fleets, or uh, several large courier companies like, for example, UPS. Today's webinar also uh, entitles you to a one-hour technical uh, informal training. So if you are, have registered for uh, the training today or for the webinar, you will automatically receive um, a certificate uh, to, uh, in participating in this training today. If you got around uh, the um, uh, boardroom table, please send us the names, job title, company, and the email to webinars at imw.ca and we will send you out the certificates as soon as possible. During the discussion, um, there's a, an option for, for you to uh, ask questions, which we are going to answer at the end of the discussion. Uh, so please uh, have a look on the right-hand side. There's a, there's a module you can use to uh, answer your questions, and uh, you can also raise your hand in between but we, we rather uh, keep the questions coming in and then we're going to answer them after the presentation. Uh, a little bit about our speaker today, uh, Ricardo Hansen uh, has seven years uh, experience in renewable natural gas and the biogas technology, and he has been instrumental in the sale and the completion of a broad array of biogas projects globally for green lane, including landfills and large-scale animal waste digesters. Uh, he is a regular speaker on topics uh, relating uh, to um, the uh, anaerobic uh, digestion. Prior uh, to working with Cleanland, Ricardo was a development manager for Environmental Fabrics Incorporation, where he helped develop 40 lagoon carbon digesters in the U.S. and international. Ricardo also has uh, experience with uh, in environmental permitting and emission reduction projects with 10 farm, 10 farm projects uh, for the uh, Environmental Credit Corporation in Mexico. Uh, Ricardo is also an active member of the uh, American Biogas Council and the Biogas Association of Canada, where he has spoken uh, at several events globally uh, for example, at the Global Industry Conference, including uh, AXTAR conferences, Global Methane Initiative, and the Latin American Carbon Forum. So um, let's hand it over to uh, Ricardo, um, and uh, let's kick it up. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ricardo Hamden. Uh, I am with uh, Green and Biogas, and let me get this started. We're part of uh, the Pressure Technologies group of companies, um, and uh, let's get into it. 
presentation today is called Renewable Natural Gas uh, from Production to Pump. So we're going to go real quick through uh, what it is, you know, the beginning of the process all the way to the pump and, you know, what Greenland and IMW do to help you achieve your Renewable Natural Gas projects. So let's begin uh, talking a little bit about uh, Greenland, uh, who we are, and our parent company, Pressure Technology. We were started in 1986 as Greenland Bagas. Uh, originally, the company was based in New Zealand. And the origin of Greenland was to serve the then booming compressed natural gas industry in New Zealand. In 2014, Greenland was acquired by a company out of the UK called Pressure Technologies PLC, uh, a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, we are headquartered in Sheffield, United Kingdom, and we are listed in the London Stock Exchange AIM market. This is a small company uh, technology market. Pressure technology specializes in the technology for containment and control of liquids and gases in pressure systems. Um, this is uh, very exciting for Greenland. Um, we are very uh, excited to be a part of such a large group. Pressure technology started in 1897, so it's a company that has been going on for over 100 years. Um, our company and our division, Greenland, um, has different companies. Uh, the first one is the Green Lane brand, which is the biogas upgrading technology. The second one is the gas compression. We, uh, we do some of that with our Flotec brand in Australia and, and New Zealand. Uh, we do some industrial heat exchangers with CALS, and we do technical support, field services, and parts with the aftercare brand. Where do we have Green Lane installations? We have really all over the world, uh, and we're very happy to display this. Uh, again, we have in, in the Americas, we have uh, about 19 installations in North America. Uh, we have one installation in Brazil, and we have over 70 installations, I'm sorry, 60 installations in, in Europe. So then again, uh, we're doing about 80 plants uh, so far in our portfolio. Our team uh, is divided in different locations. We have an office, obviously, in the United Kingdom. We have an office in Auckland. And then we have an office uh, in Germany and one in, in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, in these different offices, you know, we have uh, sales service support. And then we also have a complete team of engineers uh, that design and service with the manufacturer uh, of these products. So we have in our team uh, post engineers, mechanicals, electrical controls, uh, just a wide array of, of of people to serve the different needs of uh, our clients and customers. I'm W in Green Lane. Uh, we were doing business for a while now uh, with a highly scalable configuration for projects of uh, varying sizes uh, in, in various industries. Uh, standardized uh, compressor units, uh, we are, uh, of course, working on the non-lubricated compression technology because of the no uh, oil carryover. And also uh, the professional engineering support with global partners and the service network uh, mm -hmm. on uh, with, with Green Lane, of course, as well. So uh, we've done uh, several projects in in the United States and uh, in Canada with them, and uh, we're hoping this is going to be an ongoing basis. Right, and uh, and again, we're really excited about this, and uh, and you know, it, the IMW technology fits so well after our systems, and uh, you know, especially for. Uh, virtual pipelines and, and just to compress it up to pipeline specifications and to get it down uh, to the grid. So, so it, it really is it's a natural marriage and, uh, you know, we couldn't be happier to, to have such a great partner in IMW. So, okay, so let's, let's now get into, um, you know, what do I need to create renewable natural gas from biogas? So let's get an introduction first uh, to, uh, you know, what biogas is, what the difference is between biogas and biomethane. And let's try to get, uh, for those who don't know very much about the, the subject, um, you know, just to point out the difference. Anyway, so I'm just going um, just going to explain real quick, you know, where it comes from, uh, the different biogas characteristics. So biogas is about 60% methane, 40% CO2. Um, sometimes some of these components, if especially they're going to landfill sites and coming from other places where there's a, a different kind of substrate going in, it might have some nitrogen, some oxygen. It also has, uh, you know, big amounts of hydrogen sulfide in it uh, and water. So those are the main components. The big difference between biogas and natural gas is that the natural gas has about 98% methane and, you know, very little of these other components. Uh, about a million BTUs. 
And uh, again, you know, different sizes, um, you know, we're going to have a, a slide here that compares the different sizes of milling BTUs. So for example, um, you know, for a gallon of diesel fuel or a gallon of gasoline, you know, it, it, it could fit in a tank, as you can see in this slide. Uh, for natural gas and ambient pressure, um, you know, it could be almost to the size of a bus. So imagine, like, you know, a million BTUs, how big it is. It is the size of, 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 a, of a big um, school bus. Then when you compress it, you know, we're using the, the Greenlight and IMW technologies, you know, it gets to, say, the size of a uh, medium dog. Um, and then after, if you go to liquefaction, you know, it gets to the size of a small dog. So that's, uh, that's this slide gives you a bit of perspective on a million BTUs, how big it is, and how small we have to get it, right? Okay, so how does an upgrading unit work, and how does the green link system work? It is a very simple concept, and, and again, one of the things that, that our clients tell us time and time again is, I really like your, your product because you use water. So the only thing that we're doing here is playing with the solubility of water uh, to remove these components, to remove the carbon dioxide, to remove the hydrogen sulfide, to remove uh, all the other components that were in the water. So we do that uh, in a very, very simple way. And then also, we don't waste water. So we regenerate this water and in a process. So our process is completely closed loop. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit about how the different steps of the process are on the next slide. OK, so how does the Greenly water scrubber works? And what I tell people often is our system works uh, in a way that um, think about it as a soda machine. So I'm going to go step by step on our process. Um, the first thing that we do is we start with the raw biogas that comes from these dairies, from these landfills, from these wastewater treatment plants, and we go into a compressor. We have two types of compressor. Um, you know, the, the one at first is a screw compressor, a uh, water flooded screw compressor. It's for our smallest unit. From our mid-sized unit to the largest unit, we do a two-stage um, rotary rain compressor. We compress then the natural gas up. To, I'm sorry, the biogas up to 120 psi, uh, or nine bar for those who operate in metric. And then we go for to the first stage. So the first stage is called the scrubber, and it's a column to the very right, if you can see there. And in the scrubber, what we do is, you know, we put the gas from the very bottom, and from the very top, we spray it with water. This water has been chilled to about seven degrees Celsius or 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in this process, as it gets sprayed, uh, the, this tower is pressurized, and it is full with uh, different media. Uh, so there are little balls, and we basically shower this gas. And as it goes through, it gets attached, um, the CO2, the H2S, all the other components get attached to the water. And then the methane comes out on the top. Uh, the methane is at 98% um, you know, methane, about 2% CO2 goes on the top. Then it goes to the drying system. To the right, you can see on the green arrow. Um, and this gas dryer is a temperature swing absorption dryer. And in this dryer, we get it to five specifications. We remove all the moisture, and it's ready to go. What happens next? This fizzy water that we created, or this water with all the contaminants attached to it, then goes to what we call the flash tank. So the flash tank is the third little tank to the very left. Um, and in there, what we do is basically we reduce the, the pressure and um, we let the, the methane that was trapped, the little methane that was trapped, uh, to release. So this is a second catch of the methane. This methane that gets released in that stage then goes back to our inlet, to our raw biogas, to be processed again. By Doing this, we achieve uh, recovery rates of 98, 99%, uh, which makes our systems very, very attractive. After this, after we just completely reduce the, the pressure and in the water, then we send it to the next stage, which is the stripper stage. And this stripping stage, basically what we do is we try to remove this contaminants from the water. And what we do is that we inject air into this stripper stage and then push it out into the atmosphere at this stage where it says air disposal, that's our tail gas. Our tail gas has very little amounts of methane, about 0.5 to 1%. Um, and then from there, <clears throat> uh, we put a, either an activated carbon or some sort of hydrogen sulfide removal. All the hydrogen sulfide removal that went in uh, will go out through this 
step right here. So um, we're very, very friendly with H2S. You don't have to really remove it at the beginning. And, uh, and again, you just have to uh, worry about emissions and, and put an activated carbon or some other systems that we're also able to, to provide and facilitate. So this is basically in a nutshell how our system works. Um, and then from here, it would go, and we're going to go through it later with the supply chain. We go through IMW new compressors, and then from there into the different applications, either pipeline, gas stations, or whatever you want to do with it. So what are the main advantages of the green lane system? Um, the number one, as I said before, a lot of clients really like the fact that water is used as a scrubbing agent, that we don't have absorbents, we don't have contaminants, we don't have chemicals, we don't use solvents, um, that it's just water. And that makes it a very safe, very eco-friendly uh, process, and people really, really like that. We're also a fully automated system, and the full automation uh, is another thing that, that's very attractive. Our plants are, are very green button, red button. They really require very little maintenance, uh, very little operation. Uh, so, so people really, really enjoy this. The next step is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide, uh, most of the other upgrading systems uh, need to remove this hydrogen sulfide before going into our system. Our system can uh, take you know, up to 2,500 ppm of H2S. Um, and really, that's really a great news for people that have digesters because digesters normally go, uh, you know, up to you know 2,000, 3,000 or more. So in, in the matter that the fact that we don't need to remove the H2S uh, really, really helps, um, you know, our different clients. And then of course our, our track record. You know, we have over 80 installations worldwide, uh, different countries all around the world, and you know they're being very successful. Another thing that's uh, very attractive is, uh, you know, the 20 years of experience that we have maintaining these plants is, you know, have made our, our systems uh, just highly available. You know, we, we have, we achieve uh, availability to up to 95% or more. Um, and again, uh, we, we also provide an aftercare system and an aftercare plan that, uh, you know, helps achieve those levels of, uh, you know, little maintenance. As I said before, the aftercare team has 24-hour uh, data collection, 24-hour phone support. You know, we have different maintenance packages, and um, you know, if we need to go service your plan, we guarantee that we'll be there in less than 48 hours or, or about 48 hours max. So uh, we have different products. Okay, there we go. We have different product product lines. Um, they're named after New Zealand trees, which is you know something that is great for branding, uh, not great for pronunciation. We have the Kanuka, uh, the Rimu, the Matai, and the Totra series. They're all containerized, as you can see uh, in this slide. And also the towers stay um, in the Kanuka. They're on top of the Kanuka. The Rimu, Matai, and Totra have them outside. The Chitara Plus is a non-containerized unit. It's our largest unit. And uh, again, we have a process container. And after that, we have also a control room in our system. The children, the radiators in this model that we have here are on top. That's for European countries. Um, and for in North America, we have the children radiators on the ground because we don't have that much of land issues. We have different models. Um, as, as I mentioned before, and here are some of the ranges. So a Kanuka, uh, which is our smallest model, goes up to 185 SDFM or 300 cubic meters hour. Uh, our Rimu model um, goes from about 470 SDFM to about um, or, or 750 cubic meters hour. The next is the Matai. The Matai goes up to about 690 SDFM, 1100 cubic meters hour. A Totra goes to up to 1125 or 1800 cubic meters an hour. And the Totra Plus goes up to 1500 SCFM or 2500 cubic meters an hour. Again, uh, you know, these are mostly all, all of the containerized except for our Totra Plus. And, uh, you know, it's very, very plug and play, very simple. Let's talk about waste to pump. And uh, waste to pump is, is what I denominated the supply chain of renewable natural gas. This is a little bit about 
you know, the, the RNG supply chain, if you will. You start with an anaerobic digester and landfill, as mentioned before. Uh, some of these people, uh, what they do is they have electric generation, so they divert some of this biogas into electric generation, and then the biogas upgrading system. Some people just do the biogas upgrading. Uh, it really depends on, on what, what are your needs at the different sites. Uh, from there, we go into you know, biomethane testing. Uh, this is typically provided by the utility company, uh, just to make sure that we're on spec. From there, uh, we go into what we call the secondary compression and the utility injection. So this is where IMW goes in. So from our system, after the whole process is done, goes then into an IMW compressor. And then from there, it goes either to pipeline or to the fueling stations. So this is, what, uh, this is very interesting. It's how do I know if I have a project? You know, how do I know if my wastewater treatment plant, my landfill, my digester is, is good and for the different applications? Okay, sorry about that. So this is for different fleets. Um, the different fleets, uh, you know, you have your very resilient fleets, fleets to the no CNG fleets. And what, what determines, uh, you know, if, if I have a CNG project, yes or no? Uh, different things. The diesel, the, the price of diesel, obviously right now it's, it's way below, you know, 225. Um, you know, the different vehicle maintenance costs, they're extremely large. Uh, you know, these resilient fleets won't even take that very well. Um, then you go in from there into the marginal fleets. The marginal fleets are school buses, refuse trucks, you know, those, those type of fleets. Um, if there's a drop in the profitability, um, it's typically when, when they're too small. And, uh, and if they drive or they don't operate more than 10,000 miles per bus. So that gives you a, a, a bit of an idea of you know, large fleets as opposed to marginal fleets as opposed to no CNG fleets. You know, what are the different components that help profitability? This slide talks about vehicle fuel versus other uses. And this is something that's very interesting here because you know, we say, you know, when they say, well, the biogas can be used for electricity, people tell me all the time. And I, and I tell them, Yes, it can, but uh, you're really using, per MMBTU value, you're really losing about, you know, 55% of the power that you could potentially use there. Um, you know, the efficiency of, of gensets is, you know, 35, you know, some of them are really good and go up to you know, 41% efficiency. Um, you know, once you get generation, there's a little bit of loss, and then, you know, the end use, there's, there's no loss. In the natural gas, if we're going to want to go through an RNG process, um, we have a 9% loss in, our, in the process from, you know, the, the well into, you know, the pipeline. Once it gets to the pipeline, there's a 3% loss, and at the end use, it's about 8%. So the total energy that you really obtain from the source, you know, goes to about 81% total after it gets transferred into the house. And when you get electricity, it, it's about 33%. So there's really a big difference between, you know, putting your biogas into um, the natural gas or into the electricity. Again, another advantage of doing vehicle fuel versus um, other uses is, you know, obviously, again, the efficiency, which I've mentioned before. Um, a lot of these farms and, and landfills have uh, utility vehicles, service vehicles, so, you know, it, you already have them, and the cost of diesel is high. Um, what's happening now in the market is because of the discovery of, of natural gas as a source of energy, uh, all these biogas projects all of a sudden are not getting the PPAs that the people would want. So they're not getting a lot of money for what they're investing, and uh, they're getting PPAs at you know three cents a kilowatt hour, where before it was eight, nine, ten cents. So they're no longer making sense on the electricity side. And uh, again, you know, CNG vehicles are, are very a proven technology, and um, and there's different vehicles and everything happening all around the world. Fueling stations being deployed by people like Clean Energy and IMW. So uh, this is again, this is uh, some of the reasons why right now converting your vehicles to to natural gas 
and using renewable natural gas makes sense. Okay, so let's try this one more time and see. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, let's go back. Okay, when you're doing feasibility studies, and for those who work at consulting firms and engineering firms, um, this is something that, that we base it on. Um, you know, there's about 7.4 diesel gallon equivalent per MMBTU. Uh, one gallon of diesel contains an average, you know, 0.135 MMBTUs. So this is just kind of to keep an idea of MMBTU and diesel gallon equivalents. Um, so once you have this calculation, um, you can tell then graph the different prices, and this is, this comes from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, and you graph uh, the high price and the low price. So in this case, you know you have the lowest price at 2.6, and you have your highest price at you know 3.4, and we obviously use the lowest you can possibly get as you know your price to base the system at. Once you do your math and evaluate, you know, how much you'll, you'll be displacing on, on diesel fuel, then you also have to consider in your cost model uh, the heating cost of digesters, you know, the biogas upgrading cost. In the case of a landfill, you know, the cost of maintaining the wells, um, you know, doing the testings, uh, the CNG compression cost, uh, the upgrading costs, additional labor, um, and the utility consumption of, of the piece of equipment or the parachute load. Then you put in there your capital expense, you know, your cost of financing, uh, the development and permitting expenses. And after that, after you've gone through all this different assessment of, of numbers and technologies, if your system and if your model gives you an RR from 18 to 25% or above, then your project is feasible and, and you can continue. So this is uh, something that, that I, we recommend that you do, um, you know, before you're looking at doing an, an RNG project. And it's something that, that we help typically our, our, our clients to, or now our consultants to, to achieve. Okay, now, if this is, if you're doing CNG, if you're sending to pipeline, there's a complete different story. And uh, if you're sending to pipeline, it is very interesting what's happening now in the United States because there's, there's a, a thing called the low carbon fuel standard and the renewable fuel standard in the United States. The whole premise on the carbon fuel standards or renewable fuel standards is to displace um, some of the fossil fuels into renewable fuels. And again, there's different components to it, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the low, low carbon fuel standard next. Um, and the premise behind it is that, you know, in your normal diesel, um, which is ultra low sulfur, you know, it gives, you, gives it a, um, a greenhouse gas grade of uh, 95. So you have and it's based on, on the life cycle of um, you know this system. So it goes all the way over how it was created up until you know how it gets to the pump, and then when it gives him an, an environmental impact. So for diesel, it's about 95. The compressed natural gas is about um, 68. Um, if it comes from landfill gas, it goes to 13, and it goes from dry anaerobic digestion. It has negative 15, and this is all said by the California uh, Air Board. And, and again, you know, this is basically, you can use your RNG project to offset, you know, the different greenhouse gas emissions, and not only that, you get credits for that. So this incentives allow these projects, these RNG projects, to become extremely attractive and feasible. Again, um, this project is, is volatile, so we have to uh, understand that, you know, this, this is going to change. And what's happening right now in Congress, and, uh, you know, what happened with the EPA, is that um, we have now in the, the, the history of biogas, we have now entered into cellulosic range. Before we had, we have belonged to the advanced biofuels category um, of renewable fuels, and we now have, um, you know, the EPA determined earlier this year, actually in August, that, that we were now selling that fuel just because of, you know, where it's coming from, uh, the different origins of the gas and, and, and the life cycle. So combine all together, you know, the, the cellulosic uh, incentive, the advanced biofuel rent, um, the low carbon fuel standard that we're seeing here, um, you know, people are able to achieve, you know, numbers 
like fourteen dollars from MMBTU, uh, from eight to eight, fourteen dollars from MMBTU, just to give an example. So I'm talking a little, now a little bit about some case studies of different projects that we've done with GreenLink. There's a project in Germany uh, that used to be the largest in the world. It's no longer. Now it's a project in Montreal that we've done as well. Um, this is about 6,000 SDFM that we, we're having in, in Germany. It's uh, feed stuck its corn. And, and again, this, this, this project is quite impressive just because of uh, the, the amount of uh, feed stuff that they're, they're processing and the gas that they're putting out. The use of the injecting to pipeline and is used to power uh, you know, communities around uh, Gustro. This is a small system, and uh, this is very interesting because this project right here has a smallest, one of our smallest units. This unit was called the Manuka, and uh, it was put in a community, in a very small community at a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, obviously, the, the people were extremely happy. Uh, it, it provided enough uh, fuel for about 250 cars, and what Sweden did was develop uh, this little units all throughout a highway. Uh, to, to make them fueling stations. So again, this is something um, quite fascinating, um, you know, that there was this deployment of this, they call the green highway. You know, we call it the blue highway, but, you know, they call it the green highway. So that was, that was very interesting. This is a project in Japan. Uh, this is our um, mid-sized unit that we put in there. Um, we first put our smallest unit, uh, 150 normal cubic meters an hour, and then we went to our mid-sized unit. Um, we have our first plant installed there in 2004, and then two more systems in 2006, and uh, one extra system in 2012. So we have a big presence in Japan via our licensee, Cobelco. And now we're going to North America. Uh, the first project that we did is in Abbotsford, British Columbia. It is a farm. Uh, this is producing about 800 cubic meters an hour. This has all kinds of feedstuffs, including dairy, hog, poultry, uh, FOGs, DAF. Um, it's a co-digestion process. And this system is being injected right now into the Ford BC pipeline. Um, so again, you know, GreenLink's achieving the Ford BC pipeline, and most of our projects actually go into, into pipeline, which is great. And if you guys live, some of you live in BC, you can see the Ford BC uh, Renewable Natural Gas Program. And if you're a part of it, um, you know, know that you know, most of these projects come from, um, you know, a green unit, which is great. Next study is uh, Hamilton, Ontario. So this is a wastewater treatment plant. And what's unique about this is, uh, well, it's 750 cubic meters an hour. Um, and what's unique about the wastewater treatment plant in Hamilton is that they operate it in a start-stop system. So this operates Monday to Friday. And uh, it operates from eight to five. So we, you know, we, we prefer continuous operation in our plants. But you know, this just comes to show that that you know we can achieve that start stop system if we can. Um, we can get this gas into the Union Gas pipeline, and it became the reference program for an initiative uh, in Ontario to promote renewable natural gas. So again, this is the wastewater treatment plant in Ontario. Then we have a. Um, Landfill in Michigan. So this is, um, you know, 3,200 SEFM from the South Hills landfill. Um, this system is two of our largest units, and it, the difference about this is that it has a, a deox system that removes oxygen. So it's a, it's a, it's an extra unit that we have uh, to meet the pipeline specs, which is, uh, you know, great. And uh, again, this project has been in operation for a couple of years now, and it fuels um, the Redeem program. The next project is um, a landfill in Brazil. Um, this is about 1,000 cubic meters an hour of landfill gas. It is a what we call the Matai. Um, again, if you can see in this picture, you can see the, the, the process container, which is the, the silver gray container. Then behind it is the control room, and then the, the tower. These towers were in installation at the time. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're now installing and injecting. The project has been kicked off. Um, this interesting part of this project is that this project is being used for vehicle fuel in a virtual pipeline scenario. So from this, 
you know, this is a landfill, it gets purified, then from there it goes to a compressor, from a compressor it goes into two trailers, then it goes to the gas stations around the area and supplies them with uh, natural gas in a virtual pipeline mode, which, you know, I think is going to start being a trend uh, in different areas of, of uh, the United States, Canada, and around the world that don't have this connectivity. And then this next slide is our project in Montreal, in Canada. It's about 16,000 cubic meters an hour, or 10,000 SCFM. Uh, it's the largest plant in the world. Uh, it's a landfill, seven of our Totara Plus systems. Uh, again, we, this is a project in which GreenLane provided all process equipment, um, not only our, our Totara Plus, but we provided also with, you know, a natural, sorry, nitrogen oxygen removal units, uh, thermal oxidizers, biomethane compressors, uh, blowers, flares, the entire, the entire project, which is, um, is something that we're very proud of. Um, again, this is injecting into the Trans-Canada Pipeline. And, uh, and we commissioned summer of 2014, and the project has now been injecting into the Trans-Canada Pipeline since about a couple months ago, I want to say. So there's a picture of seven of our largest units. Um, we're very proud of, of this project. And, um, and that's, that's it. Um, I now would like to open the floor for some questions and see if uh, anybody has any comments, concerns. Um, Okay, thank you, Ricardo. Um, uh, before we get into questions, uh, I just want to give uh, everybody a quick reminder on the upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, we have one coming up in November on the 19th. Uh, it is actually a rebroadcast from our first uh, webinar. Uh, just one second here. Um, evaluating critical components of uh, CNG compression. This will be uh, a rebroadcast with John uh, uh, Dunaway from Cook Compression. Uh, this will be also broadcast at 2 p.m. UTC. Mm. So this is also uh, for different audience uh, over in Europe, I think. Wow, is it correct? Yeah. Well, Europe, Middle East, Africa, all the way to uh, all the way to Pakistan. Fantastic. So this is uh, a rebroadcast. Then on the 20th of November, we have uh, Jim Harbour, uh, Chief of Marketing Officer from Clean Energy Online. Uh, he has over. Uh, 15 years experience in LNG and CNG, and he will talk about heavy duty trucking. And uh, this is our upcoming uh, schedule for November. So um, now we can go into question. We quite received a couple of questions here. I also saw that uh, a couple of guys uh, raised their hand uh, in during this session, and I also see that uh, some of you guys are from South America. So if you have any uh, difficult uh, difficulties uh, speaking English, uh, Ricardo is a Spanish speaker. You can ask qu questions in Spanish. The only um, um, favor you have to do, uh, Ricardo, please, maybe if somebody asks in, in Spanish, can you translate it into English so we have it also in English, and then we go ahead, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, Roland Mustafa. Uh, can you provide the list of systems operational in the U.S. for AD, WWTP, and landfill? For WWTP and landfill? Yes. Yes, uh, we have for wastewater treatment plants, we have the, our project in Hamilton. Uh, and for landfills, we have the project in Canton uh, and the seven units in, uh, in Montreal. So those are our, our three projects, uh, you know, wastewater treatment plant landfills. Um, the other sites, the other six sites, oh, and the one in Brazil, I'm sorry, um, that's, uh, that's also a landfill. Um, the other six sites are um, in North America are anaerobic digesters. Okay, are they accessible on your webpage? Uh, yes, and if you can uh, send me an email as well, I can send you a, a, a one pager on, on them as well. Okay, fantastic. Then we have uh, another question. Um, from Hassan El Bari, uh, remove CO CO2 from biogas using NaOH. Is is it economical viable? Uh, can you re can you repeat the, the initials? Uh, the question is, uh, is to remove CO2 from biogas using NaOH. Is it econ uh, economically viable? Uh, nitrogen hydroxide, I guess. Yeah, nitrogen. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, I'm not familiar. Um, I don't know, Sean, if you're familiar with it. I'm not familiar. It sounds like it, it might be a solvent, um, and um, and it sounds like it might be a, an amine process. Um, it our technology uses water, and uh, and you know that that is an advantage to us. There's some people using amine, especially in the oil and gas industry, um, but. For us and for our clients, you know, the, the fact that, that we don't use solvents and we don't have to replace it and we're not worried about them fouling, um, you know, creates a, a great advantage. So this advantage of using uh, chemicals like the ones that you're mentioning is that, um, you know, they eventually have to be replaced, they have to be carefully handled, and, uh, and also that they lose their intensity, uh, you know, as they're sitting in storage. So um, that makes our projects more viable because we just used water, right? Okay. Thanks. Then the next question is um, how uh, how is the tail gas treated? Uh, this has been the main concern with PSA TSA system. Yes, um, we have different types of applications. It depends on really on your airport and you know who, whomever is uh, is is checking you know your your limits. So depending on what your limit is, we have several several applications. We can use um, you know, biological scrubbing, um, you know, that, that happens in, um, you know, in our wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we prefer activated carbon. It's very simple to do. Um, that, that's, um, you know, just a process that you just change the, the sacrificial media, the activated carbon. Um, there are other types of, of hydrogen sulfide removers at the very end. But, um, you know, the, the good thing here is that, um, again, we take most of it out of the gas uh, of all of it out of the gas, and we just have to uh, just put a, a very simple unit at the very end, but you no longer have the methane and everything else in it. So, again, activated carbon uh, or biological works for us. Okay. We have a next question uh, from Sean Hawk. Uh, maybe this is a question for Sean Michel. Um, what is the smallest size scrubber system and compressor that is economical in North America? Can small small farm-based systems work with a smaller digester? I can answer that. Yeah, yeah, so, go ahead. Okay, um, so we have all, all kinds of systems. I can tell you right now, for example, that, um, that we have a farm that, that we are installing a system in that, you know, that has about less than a thousand cows, and you know they're producing about a hundred and about a hundred and twenty between 120 and 180 SCFM of, of gas um, standard cubic feet per minute. Um, that is probably um, you know small end of it. Um, we can go as small as you know 50 SCFM, uh, but then again, it, it really your economics. Um, that are, are a little bit harder than you know from 100 and and above. So we're talking if uh, you know 185, it's about a 300 kW genset. It's about a thousand cows uh, if you have uh, cows, um, and about about 2,800 pigs, um, give or take. So that is just if you're talking animals. Um, but in, in terms of gas, as I said before, um, you know it's from 50 to 185, that's probably our, our smallest range. So next question from, uh, this question also comes from uh, Vanzi Seta. Uh, what happens to the H2S absorbed, uh, absorbed into the water? H2S. It gets pushed out. Um, so it comes out in the tail gas, um, all of it. So if you have 2,500, you know, PPM going in, uh, chances are that you're probably going to get, I mean, there's a less than 3 PPM of the prox gas, so there's almost none. So almost about, you know, I would say the entire 2,500, you know, goes up into the, the tail gas. Of course, you know, minus the ones that went in the product gas. So it's like 24, 93 or something along those lines. Okay. Next question is from uh, David uh, or David Freiser uh, or Freezer. Um, can you address uh, siloxane removal? S siloxane removal? Uh, siloxane, S-I-L-O-X-A-N-E. 
Yes, our system, um, in case of landfills, um, you know, and again, I'll let Joe Michelle talk a little bit more about this, but in case of landfills, um, you know, we have different uh, systems that we put in, in the process, um, heat exchangers, and, uh, you know, we, we drop temperature. We do other kinds of, uh, of process in, in the middle of the way to remove the siloxins. Uh, so our system, uh, you know, is able to achieve the siloxin removal. Uh, certain siloxins get removed naturally by our systems, but, uh, you know, in order to control those, our, um, we use different applications. But, John, if you want to elaborate on this a little bit more, um, you know more than I do on this. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, perfect example is we have a system being installed that um, our deox unit has a platinum catalyst embedded, and uh, you can get siloxane poisoning in the system. So there's a pref preferential media mixed with a car activated carbon media that goes before the system that protects the deox. As Ricardo mentioned, our system removes a certain amount of siloxanes and it gets uh, washed out in the wastewater, but not all of it. Okay, then we have a question from Richard Maddox. Uh, uh, using low heat valves or high heat valves for biomethane in calculating DGE, so a diesel gallon equivalent, I think. Uh, can you answer some this question? Excuse me, can you repeat the question one more time? Uh, using uh, LHV or HHV, so I think it's low heat valves or high heat valves yes. for biomethane, in calculating the DGE, so I think the diesel gallon equivalent. Correct. Um, I believe in that that slide. Uh, we use the low heating value. Um, it's it's important. That's that has been uh, actually. It's good that you mentioned that. Uh, that has been a, a big discussion in the rent industry. Um, the EPA. Uh, if you want to do a rent calculation, the, the EPA uh, takes in consideration the low heating value, not the high heating value. Okay. Then we have another question from John Hawks. Um, he's asking with a 26.3 cent uh, feed-in tariff rate in Ontario, in Ontario, would you expect a, a Kanuka, which is I think the product from you, could compete? Question mark. Can you can you repeat me just the the, the amount of the tariff? Uh, 26.3 cent FIT, so feed-in tariff. Feed-in tariff. Um, so the feeding tariff, my understanding is that the feeding tariff is for um, electricity. Um, and, um, and again, I am not familiar with um, you know, what Union Gas is paying for the natural gas. So I'll have to, if you send me an email, I can get in touch with the Union Gas folks and you know, get you exactly the amount that they're, they're paying. We have a REMU uh, that connects to um, you know, the the system and the remote has been very successful. Um, so I would assume that it, you know everything is, is okay. But again, I have to check the feeding tariffs for natural gas. I know the numbers in in Fort BC. I know the numbers in many other utilities. Uh, I know the numbers in the U.S. Uh, Union Gas does not have a, a program uh, in, a, in a set rate. Um, but um, but yes, the 26 cents. It's fantastic, but it's for electricity. Um, so um, that's not for natural gas injection, but I can check how much that is and get back to you. So if you send me an email, that'd be great. Okay, let's uh, move to the next question, um, also from Ramsey uh, Seta. Isn't there a health concern and regulation in the U.S. that dictate the quality of gas put into the pipeline? Yes, that's why we get um, you know the different the different specs um, you know the, the specs that we get in, to inject uh, into pipeline you know take those issues in consideration um, you know everything that could be dangerous or it could be hazardous uh, you know they they ask us to remove so uh, by us following the specs we have um, you know we have complied with those uh, health and risk standards. Okay, next question, Matthew Ong. Uh,
can Greenlight Systems meet the 990 BTU CF pipeline injection standard in California? And could you also comment on Greenland Systems treatable of the 12 consistent uh, oh, constituents of concern? Established, yeah, established by the uh, Can Air Resource Board per AB 1900. Yes, that's a very good question. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, the way I explain California to a lot of people is, um, you know, when you go to California, um, you when you pump, you know, your gasoline, you see that, uh, you know, the filters are attached to the pump. Uh, so it has this, you know, funny nozzles, uh, you know, that have to be put there to control vapors to control their emissions. Um, same is going to happen with our system. So if you get my my green lane system, you know, by itself, um, you know, depends on what kind of feedstock I'm getting in. So what kind of biogas and the quality of the biogas. Uh, you know, we can achieve, um, you know, the, the, the 990, but most likely, uh, you know, what's going to happen is that, um, you know, we, and, and again, we're developing projects in California, so I'm very familiar with this, um, that you're going to have to add additional components or, or extra equipment around to be able to to monitor all this, you know, all this data. And not only that, but but also able to achieve the, you know, the 0.1% in the case of pg e of oxygen or, you know, the different, uh, constituents, including the 990, um, just so uh, we comply. But normally, our systems, uh, you know, achieve 98% methane, and, and that and that's you know goes very well with that 990. Um, so between 98 and 99. So it's it's again um, in cases of landfills and other sites that are a little bit nastier. Uh, yes, you need extra equipment, uh, but it's, it can be doable. It's a project by project basis. And, and yeah, it's, it's a, a bit of a pain, but you know what, we're fighting through it. <laughs> okay, next question, Calvin Chu. How many waste is needed to produce an economic, economic, uh, economic biogas project, sorry? Uh, can you repeat that question again? How many waste is needed to produce an economic biogas project? You kind oh, of answered, okay. I guess, with your minimum volumes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that uh, that's a good question. That 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 requires a little bit more analysis. Um, you know, waste is a it's a it's a wide, uh, very broad word. Um, it depends if it's organic waste. It depends if it's landfill waste or if it's manure of different sorts or if it's uh, you know organic feedstock. So I'm more than happy if, if you send me an email, I can point you in the right direction with uh, digester companies and other people that, that you know, make different waste analysis. And we, we have to see what you have, uh, you know, what, what type of system do you have, and, uh, and see if it's uh, feasible or not. But I can definitely help you with that. Awesome. John Welsh, what have you seen for RIN value? Uh, in USA for small landfill biogas to G&G projects recently. What ha what have I seen from I'm excuse me can, can you R repeat that question? Yeah, what have you seen for RIN value? I, I think they're asking uh, in terms of the renewable standard. What yes. kind of premium can you get on the uh, natural gas in the U.S. market? Gotcha. Okay. Yes, that was very um, that was mentioned uh, quite a bit in uh, you know the conference that we're at. Um, again, normally what I see is just by itself, uh, rents can range between eight dollars an MMBTU uh, to about fourteen dollars an MMBTU. From that, if you're sending that to California, uh, there can be a premium of two to four dollars on top of that. So you know if you're saying eight. Let's take four dollars from eight to fourteen. So now you have uh, twelve to eighteen. So that's um, that's what I have been hearing. So we have a question from Jim uh, Jensen. Um, Jim is asking: You talked a bit about the remaining tail or exhaust gas from the system. If required by air quality officials, can the system be added to burn? or destroy the dead tail gas and uh, at what cost? Yes, um, it's called a thermal oxidizer. Uh, we have a couple of those in our sites. 
and they take a little bit of natural gas or, or methane to get started, and then they don't need anything else. It, it regenerates in itself, and it it, uh, it burns our tail gas um, using an, an oxidation um, process. Um, the cost of this varies from sizes to sizes. So again, um, you know, you can send me an email with what what you have, what size you have, and I can tell you, you know, the different costs of it. Excellent. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Cora Ab Abraham. She's asking if uh, you can give them uh, like a number of costs of, for those uh, projects, like some ballpark figures, maybe what they're ranging from, and uh, yeah. Yes, of course. Um, our systems range uh, from the smallest, which is our Kanuka model, that goes up to 185 uh, SEFM or 300 cubic meters an hour. Uh, that sits at about 1.2 million. Uh, and uh, you know our largest unit, which is our Dotara Plus, uh, that can process 1,500 SEFM or 2,500 uh, cubic meters hour. That sits at about 2.65. Um, so it's from 1.2 to 2.65, and all the models fall in between. Okay. Then we have uh, we have a question here from uh, Moro Sarema Insora. Are you currently looking at any projects in Africa or South Africa, and if yes, uh, in which region or be specific? Um, we, I have been hearing some, but again, that's not our office. So the office that deals with that is the office of Europe. Um, so I can I can check with them, uh, but I haven't heard much, and and so that's uh, that's a short answer. I heard about a couple projects in Africa, then again. Um, that's something that we would love to get into. So if you have any leads or information, um, you know, again, send me an email. We'd be happy to entertain. Sure. Then uh, there's a question here from Paul Belloni. Uh, for a 3,000 horsepower methane electric generating operation, what would be break even or the financial estimate for covering the methane to natural gas to pipeline conversion? Okay, so, sorry, I, like, I missed the numbers again. Can, can you repeat the question? 3,000 3, horsepower. 3,000 uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Electric generator. Uh, what would be the break-even or the financial estimate for covering the methane to natural gas to pipeline conversion? Um, I, have to do the, I have to do the conversion from, uh, you know, horsepower to kilowatt then to SEFM. Um, so this is this takes, is going to take a little bit of my time to do it. I can definitely do it. Uh, if you give me the, your contact information, I can uh, just run a, a quick analysis and, and, and let you know. Uh, but if in, in the essence of time, I don't think I can do it right now on the fly. Uh, so if you can just send me an email, um, I'll be more than happy to help you with this. Okay. Next question, uh, what is your plan to, in introducing the system in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, North Africa region, and why not till now? Um, well, one of the reasons why not till now is, uh, you know, has been that uh, the Middle East is, uh, you know, it's, it's full with, uh, you know, gasoline, diesel. I mean, the prices are very, very low, so is natural gas. But things are changing. Um, you know, we have uh, definitely a, a couple of projects that, that we are developing all around uh, the world, and some of them are in Qatar, some of them are in uh, you know some other parts of Dubai, and some other parts of the Middle East are very interested in uh, the organics and you know dealing with organics and, and making renewable natural gas. So I'd say between now and the next couple of years, you're going to see you know quite a couple of projects going on, uh, up in the Middle East. Okay, next question. Uh, this is from John Welsh again. Can your system remove nitrogen and oxygen from landfill biogas? Um, if you want to remove nitrogen and oxygen from uh, our system, we have to add an additional component. Uh, if, the, if the levels are very high, we just add a different module um, that we put in our systems and we remove it. So the answer will be yes, uh, but we have to add a, a diff, uh, an extra module that, that we offer. Okay, next question. Um, there's also a question here from uh, from Nasser Esfani. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you please give some indication 
on the typical size of investment capital cost in North America. Typical size of a landfill? Uh, of investment capital costs in North America. Uh, okay, an estimate capital cost of a project in North America for a landfill again, Thomas? Yeah. Let, let, okay. Let's assume it's a landfill, yeah. Okay, so um, oh, um, it goes from, it really varies. Um, so, you know, the landfills that, that we've done, again, you know, we've gone from, you know, the smallest landfill, uh, you know, I said the one in Brazil. Um, that one, from our system, it was about, you know, one point, no, it was $2 million, $2.5 million total um, with all the additional components and everything. Um, so that's about an, an average size landfill, I want to say. Um, then we have, you know, one of the largest, you know, in the world, uh, in Montreal, and, and again, that's seven of our largest units. It's a really massive project, and that goes to, you know, it was a $30 million project. But, um, but normally, I would say between, uh, for our part of the work, um, you know, it'll be for an average size landfill about two, two million, two million dollars, two and a half. Depending really depends on what size you have, how big it is, and you know other other aspects. Farms completely different story. Farms can be a lot, um, you know, a lot less. So uh, it, we just wanted to uh, wrap up uh, because we're at about ten after. Because the questions are still coming in, um, and we don't need to be anywhere, we will hang on a little bit after and answer these. Um, so uh, when you folks, uh, if you do need to leave, uh, by all means, uh, you feel free to jump off the line now. Uh, when you get a, an update next week from us, uh, it will include some of the Q&A as well as a link to the YouTube video, which will go full length. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, for anyone who does want to hang on, uh, feel free. Uh, we have still... Uh, Twelve more questions or something. There's a few good questions here, so we might as well carry on. But uh, again, just uh, uh, a reminder: if you want to reach IMW, uh, you can reach us at uh, IMW.ca, and uh, you can reach find out more about webinars by emailing webinars at IMW.ca with your role today, um, and um, also IMW.ca forward slash webinars will get you to the webinars page for upcoming webinars. Um, and uh, Ricardo. Uh, you can reach him at ricardo.hamdan at greenlanebiogas.com. Greenlanebiogas.com is the website for Greenlane. And uh, as I said, um, we can uh, just um, we'll just stay here and, and carry on with Q and A. Uh, there's a few. Uh, here, here's a good one. With your system, what pressure does the scrub biogas come out before going to CNG fueling station compressor? Uh, 120 psi. Or nine bar. Excellent. There's a lot of capital. This is actually an interesting one. The capital cost ratio. You have a figure related to capital cost and operating cost per kilowatt or per gigajoule, etc. Say say that again. A, a, an operating ratio uh, for capital cost per kilowatt. This is one of those scenarios where I think you probably need to do a, um, uh, like a 10-year uh, amortization to figure this out, but essentially an operating cost per kilowatt or an operating co cost per gigajoule, and then additionally the capital cost. Yeah, that would be something that we have to, uh, to get um, to start working on and, and something that I have to do, uh, you know, a complete uh, analysis. Typically, um, you know, the best, typically our, our Consultants are, you know, the developers of the projects are the ones looking at this figure very closely. Um, so again, I just can either ask them directly or I can do an analysis myself. So if they can send me an email, yes, uh, I can definitely uh, run the numbers for you. Excellent. And just so everyone knows today, um, your questions, uh, they do have your name next to them and we'll receive them after. So we'll be able to respond individually and just make sure that uh, you got answered adequately as well. So um, what water use rates uh, what are the water use rates, and can the water be recycled or is it discharged? The water, um, this is a, a more of a Jean-Michel question. Um, we reuse about, I would say, 95% of our water. Um, there's a little bit of it that, that you know goes out into the system as makeup water. Um, I think it might be more than 
uh, you know, more than 95%. I mean, we reuse almost all of our water. Um, I don't have the exact figure here. Um, I don't know if Joe Michelle is still on the line, um, but I can I can get the exact number for you. Okay. Um, there's a lot of capital cost ones, and I think we've kind of answered those. Obviously, there's a lot of people who are interested. So, got some more questions. When operated continuously, how does the system respond to variation in biogas quantity and quality? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, very good one. Um, we have a great turnaround. That's another one of our advantages. Um, you know, we can. Uh, it all depends on the speed of the compressor. So we can go down to about 30% of our max. So, um, you know, if it's if you're talking 1500 SCFM, uh, you know, it can go down to uh, 450. Um, so, so that turnaround of 30% really makes the fluctuations not really affect our system, which we we like and enjoy. Okay, that's okay. it. Um, thank you for joining today, uh, our webinar. Thank you to Ricardo. Thank you to Sean Michel and also David Monlaw. Um, if you have any further questions, as mentioned by uh, by James already, uh, please email at uh, webinar at uh, imw.ca. And uh, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.